This is like a welcome back for you guys with the Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra. I know uh, you're both from the Chicago area and you probably started your or orchestral life here with this ensemble. And now, look at you guys, just at the top of your game. It's amazing. It's an, what, what you guys have achieved is an amazing accomplishment for any young musician. Um, but in light of this conversation, it especially show, so as, as young African-American uh, musicians. So I just personally, I am just so proud of you guys and amazed at the work that you do and the quality of your playing. It's really beautiful. Um, but let's talk about that, because no one achieves anything on their own. Uh, there's people along the way, there's systems put in place. Uh, there's a pipeline, whether you call it as, as much. So, Damari, I know you're, you're passionate about this, this issue of education and, and exposure. So let, mm -hmm. let's just talk a little bit about your road, starting off as a, as a young musician, as a young African-American, and your experience in, in mentorship and exposure and, and those kinds of things. Sure. Um... It's 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 a long story that I will I will give you the yeah, abridged the abri version got 30 minutes, yes. of it. Really, I mean, this um, it's difficult to to you know to let's say to get to into a professional orchestra. It's not it's not easy. easy. That's an understatement. But um, in our case, it began with an instrument. Um, um, I, were, I was fortunate enough to have a wonderful um, flute teacher around the corner. Um, a really pivotal moment um, uh, happened when I, when I enrolled in Edgar Allan Poe Classical School on the South Side and had a wonderful teacher, Barry Elmore, um, who really, I believe, is the key reason why so many of my classmates, I'm talking about from when I was seven years old, are, are wonderful, productive, um, successful in, in the broad and best sense. I mean, uh, productive citizens. Uh, I think a lot has to do with, with him. Um, our parents um, uh, um, raised us in an environment where we could, we could achieve anything that we wanted to. There was none of this, oh, you want to be a musician? It's like, tell me what you want to be. And it can change the next week, it can change the next month, but having these, these goals to strive towards. Um, tell, tell me about when you were in the CYSO. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, were you guys in the, the orchestra at the same time together? Well, that's a good um, story because I, you know, I followed in my brother's footsteps mm -hmm. all the way. That's why I started with him yeah, first as yeah, the elder brother. Yeah, yeah, it's a good call, good call in this case. <laughs> and he's four years older. And, I was gonna ask. Yeah. And um, I joined the CYSO um, at, at a younger age than I was, I shouldn't tell this, I, that I was supposed to. I think I was like a year or you two younger. They than grandfathered that. you Yes, in, they so did. I had yes. the older brother in the orchestra. They grand brother but, you in. Um, <laughs> This, for me, that was the kind of highlight of my childhood. It's because my brother was a superstar, is a superstar, but was as well here in Chicago growing up. He played on this stage when he was 15, and I saw that early on. I was able, he was able to be an immediate and direct role model to me so in did the you, orchestra. Were there other young people, young musicians of color in the CYSO at that time, or were um, you? There were, I, I would say there were a couple, a few. Mm -hmm. A few. Was that and important, seeing that there were other young musicians like yourself, so that you weren't oh, just the only one? Absolutely. I mean, I was fully aware of I, when I would go to the competition, to any competition. I said this in an interview when I was a teenager. I mean, I, I, I loved it. You know, I relished the attention of not being at that time. All of the flute players were, I mean, they were blonde. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and here I, mean, I naturally. am. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Yes. Um, One of my why. former CYSO uh, um, <laughs> players, we, we played together in quintet. But it, yes, it was very, very important during the same time. I mean, having that, uh, looking across the stage and seeing someone that looked like you actually, even if we never said a word to each other, there's, there's a community there. And around the same time, I have to mention, um, um, I was also going to, the, to Interlochen Arts Camp. Mm -hmm. and. Anthony and I were talking about this earlier, about the fact that um, he grew up seeing me. Mm -hmm. And I can't take all the credit for his success. But I, no, I, I can't, but he grew up in a very musical, <laughs> I won't take all of it, I'll just take 20%, Anthony. <laughs> okay? 
Oh, and Chicago Teen Ensemble, and Barry Chica Elmore right. and Connected. We were in environments um, and ensembles with, with people that look like us. And I think that that, I know that that was, that was a tremendous influence at Interlock and one of the, another major turning points, there were countless turning points. There was a, a, a guy named um, Bill Bomar who was maybe a year or two older than me. And so I guess I was maybe 13 at the time and I heard him play the last movement of the Cacheturian um, violin concerto transcribed for flute. And he was black. And that there's no coincidence that, I mean, I was blown away by his playing, but I was just in an, in an audience. And I remember thinking, I can do this. I will do this. And that's when I went, I went back home and I, and I learned the concerto. And that was the beginning of, of, of my trajectory, I would say, as an artist. And um, so it's important. Frankly, none of us can do what we do in the world, in life, without mentors. Whether we call them that or they, are, they call themselves that or not, we all have them. And I think that acknowledging that is really an important uh, part of the process of this discussion. I would like to just um, say something that I believe will solve a lot of um, problems. I mean, you know, we're having a good time here, but this is about, uh, we're supposed to be having a conversation about diversity and inclusiveness. Um, if there were, um, let's say, if we saw 50 black musicians in the Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra, um, or all the orchestras around the world, um, I believe that we would see more. In professional, professional orchestras. Professional orchestras. Yeah. We, and I, I mean, I, I really, I, I believe that. You, you, you see a lot of uh, uh, really wonderful Asian musicians in youth orchestras. You see a lot of wonderful Asian musicians in professional orchestras now. More so than when I was growing up, mm -hmm. for sure. And so you say this is important for me, and because of that reason, sure. we see two or three people that look like me in a youth orchestra. We've been in ensembles where I've, you know, I've seen two or three people in professional orchestras. So that inclusion at the very beginning of people's education. Yeah, you see it, mm -hmm. and then you want to be it. Right. right. Everyone who comes to see any orchestra, we see you on stage, and we want to be you. There are kids in the audience when you play tomorrow, there'll be kids uh, in the audience when you play next week or the weeks that really see you on stage and they want to become you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how it starts from a very young age. You might have even done it yourselves. And that's what's beautiful about it. And so creating that atmosphere and encouraging that sort of, that's what it's really all about. It's about community, it's about reaching out, it's about role models so for, for people, that's, any people. That's in the, the youth orchestra community and at the education level, that exposure, that inclusion, building that culture of seeing modeling for all people in the community. Let's talk a little bit about the gap then between that ideal and the current situation, which is why we're here and, and, and why this session has been called in terms of what is the reality now that you guys are in professional orchestras do, do you see as um, some, some areas for improvement um, around the culture of inclusion in professional orchestras? So I've spent a large portion of my life um, playing in professional orchestras. And in my time, I was always, um, I felt comfortable in my orchestras, even though there were um, only one there was only one black person. Are you person. including yourself in that yeah. one? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> in, so there's two total. Yes. But <laughs> like okay. looking on, basically to tell you, to kind of put you in the, the, the realm of what we're looking at in our mm -hmm. field is that to look and see another black person on stage with me is a very unusual occurrence. Mm -hmm. And so in Cincinnati, I had a colleague in the orchestra, but he got into the orchestra before it was okay. Before it was okay. Before what was okay? To be black on stage in a professional symphony orchestra. Right. So he wasn't treated very well, actually, okay. because people weren't accustomed to it and it wasn't accepted. Mm -hmm. And you know, and so this is what happens when there is things look a certain way and everything's fine, is that when you are the first, and this was, you know, back in the late sixties, sure. he had a really hard time. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for sometimes I tell people this and they're shocked. Yeah. They're like, what do you mean? 
And, and I think it's important for us to know that. And then from there, we can understand that I had it easier because of what he did and what they did before us. And, but, for the people setting the Now, do you feel like stage. it's because the ensembles that, I mean, obviously it's a different time right now, but do you feel like those ensembles that you've performed with and are a member of, that they have somehow created a culture within those organizations of inclusivity? Or is, have your, has your presence there been the thing to kind of spur the changing of the culture? That's a very good, int- a very good question. I mean, we could talk about this for hours. But, but, I, but I think there has, been, that, there has been a, 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 t- a shift because the, the reason we're all here and we're talking about this is because people see that being aware of these things, being aware of how we all need to be involved in discussing this and kind of contributing to the community at large mm-hmm. is a really important moral imperative mm-hmm. for our industry, for our world, mm-hmm. um, so that no one feels uncomfortable sure. once they do make it into an, any kind of orchestra. And just being aware of it that you know, that we can all do this, you know, together is something that is so amazing, I think, for our field Mm -hmm. that we are aware of this. So from pipeline Mm -hmm. to professional, that you guys have this perspective now. Um, Have you ever, to your knowledge, experienced any kind of unconscious bias? in that pipeline anywhere along the way from, I don't know, audition process, you know, uh, being on a probation for tenure while, you know, I know how they, you know, principal, you're in probation for a while and all that kind of thing. Any, in terms yeah, of I, people, I, you, you know, I understand. this is, sure. I understand. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say most likely, the reason why I say most likely it's, it's for two reasons. The first reason is the reason why it's not absolutely, but I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of saying it with a wink. I mean, yes, of course. But the reason why I'm not saying absolutely is because um, I've always been so focused on my goal, mm-hmm. so focused on my goal that I, w- I will literally, literally run through in, in, anything that, that keeps me from accomplishing that goal that's negative. You know, right. that's, that said, the reason why I know that, that yes, I have is, is actually not via me, and this is not the topic, but I have witnessed tons of sexism. So what I was gonna say is because of that, you can assume that um, there is that. It just hasn't stopped me. Right, you have to, so a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about it can happen very subtly. Mm-hmm. You know, we just we just did a, a specific kind of training in my orchestra recently, oh, did you? and and you talk about it, and it's because oftentimes there. So let me just. So on. who was involved in that? Was it board staff, musicians, or was it just musicians? Oh, for this particular meeting, it was it was the, or- the orchestra. Okay. And so we had a specific kind of training. It wasn't um, just specifically unconscious bias, but it dealt with sex, um, uh, sexual discrimination and sexual harassment and racial discrimination and harassment. Mm -hmm. So just that topic. And which was really great because I think in general people don't go here, like, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's really important to understand that there are things that happen subtly throughout all of our lives that because we, um, we have to go through them, we actually become stronger from the time we're little kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were, there were plenty of comments when I was younger, there were plenty of comments, you know, where, that you actually look the other way. You, you say, mm-hmm. oh, well, that person didn't mean that. That happens all the time. Mm-hmm. We, you know, and so I think this is how all of us in this room, for, for whatever reason, our differences, we have to deal with people that sometimes don't like our differences. So um, how so then how do we how do we address that as an industry? We are we are industry insiders. Right. We, we yes. are. I think thinking then, about but, it, think, thinking about it like when you're in an ensemble and you're in an orchestra, we need the same kind of base level um, kind of uh, traditions and rules that corporations have as far as like understanding each other and kind of base level like behaviors that are proper for the workplace. So you think this is, is, can be as, as simple, not as simple, but, but one idea is a policy change just at the base level of in terms of the governance and the guidelines of an orchestra as an organization. Well, I've, never, I've been in orchestra for 18 years and I've never had a meeting about 
any kind of harassment and, and, the, and, <laughs> and abuse. So it was actually a surprise to me. And it, it would be a surprise to lots of people in a lot of orchestras to just have that talk. Just ha have someone talk to you about what we all have. We all have these, these interesting biases. Talk to us about them. Like once mm -hmm. you're even in an orchestra. I think that could be an amazing thing. And Anthony, and when, yeah. what will happen is that um, those talks will actually play a role and have an effect on what you're hearing and what you're seeing in an audition. So if you, you work in the pipeline, you, you, know, you go out into the community, you, um, you, you, you feel just a few more seats with, um, you make the orchestras a little bit more, the youth orchestras a little bit more diverse. You have an opportunity, for instance, um, you provide more of an opportunity for that student to go to a school to continue learning their craft. That student then graduates from school, auditions for a position. Um, you know, like everyone else, 90% won't do well in auditions. There will be a small percentage of hopefully that larger number that will advance and then advance to the next round. Then, um, like, like in a lot of orchestras, the screen will come down. That talk that they were a part of, that session that they had at the beginning of the season will, will actually have a positive effect. Because if, there, if a bias creeps up, I think they're more likely to be aware of it. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not, does not fall solely on us as people of color to undertake this. I will so say, what, like, lots of people in this room too do this, but all the people that do all the work that brought us along the way and the pathway to success, a lot of those people did not look at like us. So it does not take right. just, you know, um, uh, hiring one person on your staff that looks, that is a person of color. It doesn't take that. It takes people that believe in um, equality, frankly, <laughs> and music education, and musical community. And it's these people that do the great work that all of you in this room can do. But what I liked is, is you talked about being a member of a community and it was more of a relationship. It's it, always a relationship. Yeah. And I believe that these are the relations, all of the mentoring and role model and we talked about, all of those were, were real relationships with mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. These weren't like um, we outreach, we go to a school and we sit with you for a second and then we leave. These weren't mm -hmm. those kind of relationances. Aren't we, we're st we still have relationships. <laughs> we have, these are my family. When I say my Chicago family that comes here and, and supports us, I really actually mean right. that these are people that are um, to this point part of my family. Right. And so when I tell people, oh yeah, I'm a part of the Merritt family, the CYSO family, uh, blah, blah, blah. I, like, I actually mean it, because mm -hmm. bet between my brother and my parents and these organizations, right. we are here. So I went to Merritt, I studied with David Tuttle. Um, the, Merritt introduced me to Larry Combs, mm -hmm. who was the principal clarinet on this stage for sure. many, many right, years. Right. And I studied, and we went up to DePaul, I played for them. I played for Julie DeRoche as well, she was an instructor at DePaul. Mm -hmm. I had lessons from them for like two years, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. You know, yes, I was talented because my brother was a superstar and I practiced as much as him. But that if I hadn't had lessons <laughs> but from these amazing yeah. people, yeah. my parents weren't musicians. Mm -hmm. They loved music, they're lovers of art, but they, our parents weren't, weren't music, musical. But somehow, we got put onto this pathway with the best folks in Chicago. It's many hands. Okay, hands, and so being able to take that for granted, sometimes mm -hmm. kids that come from the right schools and the right neighborhoods and the right amount of funding on their own, you end up in those places automatically. I think we may not have ended up, and uh, there was always a little bit of luck involved, knowing some other parent that had also sent their kid to a certain place. But it's people. The, it's people. It's people. It's relationships. Anthony, most of, mo a lot of the people that we, that look like us, that we played with as kids, they Most of them played parents. in Chicago Youth. Yes, they did. Actually, they did. Maybe so the secret is the pretty... Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra. Maybe that's the connection oh. that we all need to have to, maybe Woo. that's what it is.